Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to OEFC in Excel. And we're back in Titus, chapter one. And let me read the passage to you that we're going to look at this morning. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. We've been thinking about what kind of leaders the local church needs. Now, the Apostle Paul must have had a, a lot of confidence in Titus. Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus to lead the church in the city where he himself had taught the word of God for two years in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. The church in Ephesus became one of the most prominent churches of the New Testament era. So Timothy had a huge job on his hands. But Paul had left Titus not in a city, but on, on an island, Crete stretching 160 miles east to west with churches dotted all across it. Titus's task was even bigger, therefore. And his job was to complete unfinished business. His mission was to serve as a sort of spiritual orthodontist and straighten out a serious defect among the churches. The local bodies of Christ lack leaders. As we thought about last week, a church without elders is incomplete. So it was Titus's assignment to appoint appropriate men as elders. What kind of leaders does the local church need? Well, verses five to nine tell us. It needs multiple leaders, not just one. A leader without accountability to other elders is an accident waiting to happen. It needs male elders. This is not a, an essential gospel issue, but it is an important one. Recent church history indicates that compromise on this issue means church groups or denominations are likely to compromise years down the line on other more fundamental Christian beliefs. The local church needs blameless elders. They're not flawless, but they should be blameless. They're not faultless, but they should be above reproach. They should have a reputation within and outside of the church for personal integrity so that no mud sticks on them. In fact, there is little mud to throw at them in the first place. In explaining the application of the parable of the shrewd manager in Luke chapter 16, Jesus says this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And Paul applies this principle to the family and to the church. If a man handles a mini church well, that's his family, it indicates he might well be an effective leader of the larger church family. He's been trustworthy with a smaller responsibility, his own family. He can be entrusted with a larger one, God's family. What is the evidence he has managed his own family well? Well, he's a strong marriage. He loves his wife and has forsaken all others for her. His children are not out of control and know how to behave. They respect their parents' Christian faith. And while they are minors, at least, they sit under Christian instruction. This is where we left Titus's search for men qualified to serve as elders last week. They should be publicly above reproach and privately good family men. But Paul sets out further criteria for the type of leaders the local church needs. And in verse seven, he goes into the issue of a man's personal qualities. 
Just how well an elder will conduct himself in office is determined by character. And what were the traits of character Titus should be looking for, for in men to serve as elders in the churches on Crete? Well, let's look at these characteristics for the prospective elder in verses seven to eight. Paul uses three words to denote an elder. Firstly, in verse five, we have presbyteros, from where the word Presbyterian in English derives. Then in verse seven, there are further two words, episcopos, overseer or, or bishop, from where we derive the word episcopal, and then oikonomos. In the Greek and Roman world of the first century, an oikonomos was a, a slave or a servant who managed his owner's household for him. He was a steward entrusted with considerable responsibility and authority and was accountable only to his master. So an elder is God's steward with oversight over God's household, the local body of Christ. What should he be? Well, blameless. It's the very same word Paul uses in verse 6. It is a man to whom no accusation of impropriety could be attached. But it is also a man who embodies the godliness that comes from knowing the truth that leads to godliness. Back in verse 1, we see that. Paul then, in verse 7, goes on to list five characteristics this man must not have. What he should not be. He should not be a slave to either his ego or to his passions or to his appetites. In other words, an elder should be a master of himself. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls, says Proverbs. John Stott puts it very aptly. Ministerial candidates cannot control the church if they cannot control themselves. In other words, to be a faithful steward of God's household, he must be a good steward of himself. A man must be in control of his ego. He mustn't be in church leadership for himself, overbearing, arrogantly wanting to get his way at all costs, no matter what damage it inflicts on others. He leads. He doesn't bully. He doesn't threaten. He doesn't pressurize. He doesn't humiliate. He doesn't intimidate. Sadly, some high profile cases of pastoral abuse have come to light in recent years in this regard. They've not occurred in wacky and extreme churches, but in mainstream evangelical churches. It has affected not only the Church of England, but also independent evangelical churches. Christians in such churches have suffered great harm from the hands of those charged with their spiritual care. In some cases, pastors have become predators. Shepherds have become the sources of great cruelty. Elders have become exploiters of the vulnerabilities of those entrusted to them. While a few cases have come to national attention, there have been others that haven't gone in such publicity, but nonetheless have been no less serious. A letter published in the May edition of Evangelicals Now told of an independent evangelical church where the church members were duty bound to vote for any proposal the eldership brought to the church meeting. The elders had become authoritarian rather than servant hearted. Often, of course, it is the case that it is just one overbearing elder whom the other elders are in awe of and don't feel able to challenge. Instead of acting as a steward of God's church, he acts as if the church belongs to him. As a result, he dominates leaders and church meetings and the church suffers for it and people get hurt. No, a prospective elder must be in control of his ego. He must not be overbearing. He must also be in control of his passions. Not quick tempered, not violent, writes Paul to Titus in verse seven. It will not surprise you to hear any preacher say 
that there can be some demanding and difficult people in the local church. They could try the patience of the most Christ-like of people. Nothing is ever right for them. They always find something in the church to quibble over. How is the elder to react? Well, not with a short fuse, but with a long fuse. Not with a quick temper, but with a long temper. Not pugnaciously, but patiently. The King James Version renders not violent as no striker. It evokes the idea of somebody lashing out with their fists when provoked. I'm grateful I've never seen two people come to blows in church, but an elder or any Christian can lash out in other ways. He can have an acid tongue. He takes no prisoners. He can say cruel and cutting things. A quiet rebuke can turn into a public dressing down designed not to correct, but to humiliate and to wound. No, an elder must be in control of his passions. If he feels frustrated and his patience has been severely tested and he needs to let off steam, he should do it away from the church. In a strong Christian marriage, his wife will lend him a sympathetic ear and will give him a supportive hug. He must not be quick tempered or liable to lash out. Next, a, a prospective elder must be in control of his appetites, not given to drunkenness, not pursuing dishonest gain. His appetite for, for wine and his appetite for money should also be under strict control. The elder should not be the type of man that rubs his hands in glee at a wedding reception with an open bar or with a copious number of wine bottles on his table. He must be moderate in his drinking habits. One commentator has made the point that in, first, in the first century, the water was often contaminated. Wine was added to drinking water to sanitize it. Therefore, Paul advised Timothy to stop drinking only water, but also a little wine for his stomach's sake and his frequent ailments. Without the disinfectant of the wine, the water wasn't fit to drink. In other words, Paul gave Timothy the license to drink some wine, otherwise he might be frequently sick on account of the poor quality of the water. In the West today, we have no such problems with the water supply. It's good to drink. An elder, therefore, has no reason to drink alcohol at all, contends this commentator. He is needlessly putting himself in the way of temptation. Also, he has a responsibility to other Christians. By exercising his liberty to drink in moderation, he might become a stumbling block to a Christian younger in the faith. I understand the point this commentator is making. But he goes too far to insist on complete abstinence. It has to come down to an individual conscience. But Paul's point is clear. It is not to be much wine, but wine in moderation. Of course, people don't just have an appetite for alcohol. We have other appetites which also need to be kept in check. We have an appetite for food, for leisure, for pleasure, for relaxation. None of these appetites are wrong, but they need to be kept under control. In today's frenetic world, the most precious commodity is time. We have so many potential avenues through which to squander it. Social media, YouTube videos, and a plethora of TV channels. Again, an elder's appetite for such distractions should be kept on a leash. But there is another area in which the prospective elder needs to curb his appetite. He should not be greedy for gain, pursuing dishonest gain. If he is employed by the church, he shouldn't be in it for the money. He shouldn't see the church as an easy way to make money. His motivation should be service and not gain. How might greed for money of an elder be exhibited in the local church? Well, the elder uses people. He discriminates in favor of the wealthy over others in the church out of self-interest. The elder gets to hear that a, a well-heeled family in the church have a holiday home with sea views in a scenic village in Cornwall. He seeks to ingratiate 
himself with them in the hope of getting free use of their second home. But another family in the church with no particular assets, he totally ignores. They are of no use to him. He is mercenary in outlook rather than servant-hearted in outlook. An elder must be above such behavior, says Paul. He must be master of himself and have control over his ego, his passions, and his appetites. This is what he should not be. What then should he more positively be? What he should be? Well, how can we summarize the six marks of character in verse eight that Paul writes the elder should possess? Well, I have distilled the six qualities into three. Firstly, practical kindness. The elder should exhibit practical kindness. How is that kindness exhibited? Through hospitality. The Greek word philoxenos literally means love for strangers. The opportunity to offer philoxenos or to welcome strangers has obviously been greatly curtailed in the last year or so. But hospitality should be a defining mark of the local church and especially its leaders. Strangers should be confident of receiving a warm welcome among the local body of Christ. Richard Cokin is the pastor of Dundonald Church in Rains Park, South London, and he was a guest lecturer on the Cornhill Bible training course. I remember him telling the story how a number of South Korean students began attending the church he was pastor of. He got talking to them after the services and was horrified to find out that despite having been in the UK for a number of years, they had hardly been inside an English person's home. He noted wryly, an Englishman's home, it seemed really was his castle and the drawbridge had been raised up. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, writes the author of the letter to the Hebrews. Of a man and his wife an open home, it is one sign that the man is eldership material. They offer practical help to anyone who is in need, those whom they know and those whom they barely know. As he is able, an elder gives of his time, his resources and his encouragement in practical deeds of kindness. But there should also be a wholesomeness about an elder. He is to be a lover of what is good. That phrase in English is translated by just one word in the Greek, philagathos. Philoxenos is a lover of strangers. Philagathos is a lover of what is good. And what is wholesome? What is good? Well, it is every piece of evidence of the grace of God. It is Barnabas when he goes to Antioch. In Acts 11 and verse 23, we read of Barnabas, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad. The gospel had been received in Antioch and lives had been transformed and it thrilled Barnabas. That's wholesomeness. That is loving what is good. It is rejoicing over every sign of the grace of God you see in someone else. Perhaps someone new in the Christian faith, hungry for God's word, thirsting to know more. It's a joy in seeing another Christian battling to stay faithful to Christ despite very difficult circumstances at home or at work. It's the pleasure of seeing little acts of kindness among God's people. It's the exhilaration of seeing new people come to faith and becoming an Apostle Andrew and bringing their family and friends into church for the very first time. A lover of what is good, on the other hand, is also distressed by what is bad. Sin rampant in the church, backbiting, gossip, lack of spiritual desire and a lack of grace. Loving what is good has a price. The conscientious elder will be sorely troubled by what is bad. It is not water off a duck's back to him. He doesn't shrug his shoulders. He doesn't avert his eyes. 
it gives him a sleepless night or two. It concerns him, it bothers him, and he does what he can to put things right. That is what it is to be wholesome, taking great pleasure in what is good and worthy, experiencing deep pain is in what is bad and unworthy. Practical kindness, wholesomeness, and lastly, integrity. The third quality the elder should exhibit is integrity. There is integrity towards people. He's upright. He is, deals fairly and honestly with people. He doesn't discriminate between one person and another. He understands everyone in the body of Christ as an equal value. He doesn't favor the old over the, the young over the old, the healthy over the sick or the rich over the poor. Moreover, he doesn't put obligations on people he isn't prepared to bear himself. He doesn't encourage others to serve in the church, but then fails to put in a shift himself. His name also appeals, appears on the rotor for the less glamorous jobs in the church. He doesn't see it as a, a burden to lead, to lead and to serve, but rather as a privilege. The Greek word translated as upright is the same word the Apostle John uses of God in his first letter, assuring us that God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins if we confess them. The elder who is just and upright is a man then who reflects the just and righteous character of God. But he doesn't just show integrity towards people, he has spiritual integrity. He doesn't merely have the appearance of holiness, he is holy. He doesn't merely give the air of spirituality, he is spiritual. He doesn't just know the Bible, he knows the God of the Bible. He is poor in spirit, knowing that there is nothing in himself to commend him to God. He is all too painfully aware of his sin and his shortcomings, and he mourns them. He is transparent and doesn't try to hide his own vulnerabilities. He doesn't project himself as a spiritual heavyweight, but he's open about his own struggles and failings. But above all, he hungers for God. He has a real desire for ever greater spiritual reality, the deeper daily knowledge of Jesus making a difference in his life. He knows his life has meaning. He knows he is not a random collection of cells, rather he has a creator. There is a God who loves him and values him and who sent his son to die on the cross in the place of his sins, for his sins. So he practices the spiritual disciplines. He prays regularly and from the heart. He reads his Bible and listens attentively to God's word being preached. That is the sort of man Titus is to appoint as an elder. Positively, he does what is good, practical kindness. He loves what is good, wholesomeness. And although he would never describe himself as good, not in a thousand years, he displays integrity. He treats people fairly. He is not swayed in his treatment of people in how useful they are to him or not. There is a perceptible holiness about him. He worships God from the heart and is often in prayer and in the word of God. What becomes clear from these verses about a man's fitness to become an elder is that God's word is more concerned about character than giftedness. A man's character is paramount. What he is is more important than what he can do. Giftedness without godliness will end in tears. Character comes first and a man's gifts come second. In view of all Paul has written about the qualifications then for prospective elders and serving elders, what should be their response? Well, firstly, humility, a sense of inadequacy even. Writing about the weighty demands and responsibilities of Christian leadership to the Corinthians, Paul asks the question, and who is equal to such a task? And who is sufficient for these things, as the New King James Version puts it? Paul has set the bar so high. 
the qualifications for eldership are so exacting. Blameless men of unimpeachable reputation. Did such men exist on Crete even? Are there such men among us in Oxford, masters of themselves, masters of their egos, their passions, and their appetites? Men of practical kindness, of wholesomeness and integrity? It is understandable for any candidate for eldership to be intimidated by these requirements. It's understandable for any serving elder to feel he often falls short of the New Testament standard for eldership. So humility is the fitting response, but not despair, despite our sense of in insufficiency. In Paul's words to Timothy, serving as an elder is a noble task if it is done with integrity. But secondly, Paul's instructions to Titus serve as a wake-up call against complacency. If you have been in leadership a long time in church, it is so easy to read Paul's exacting qualifications for eldership and to shrug your shoulders and think, well, people will just have to take me as they find me. I won't change. And besides, who is there to do what I do? You can almost develop a take it or leave it mentality. That's the way I am. Church will just have to accept it. In other words, complacency sets in and once established, it is very hard to dislodge. And when leaders become complacent about their sin, it becomes contagious. From the leadership, complacency spreads right through the church. They have set the tone. The elders' moral blind spots don't seem to matter. It sends out the message to the church members that their moral blind spots don't matter as well. So Christian leaders constantly have to examine how their example affects others in the church. If they have become complacent, arrogant, even and develop this, fortune, this church is fortunate to have me type of attitude, it will not bode well for the spiritual health of the church. It will lead to disaster. Sin and selfishness will run right in the church and will destroy the church's credibility in the local community. No wonder Paul urges Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus, to watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. In other words, as a leader, don't become complacent, but keep your eye on the lofty standards of leadership in the church of Jesus Christ so that you don't pull others down. But lastly, there should be a reaction for all of us, an application for all of us. Aspire. Aspire. Not everyone serves as elders in the local church. There are sheep and there are under shepherds. There are the led and the leaders. It's not a question of status in the kingdom of God, but of role. But every Christian should also aspire by God's grace to be masters of him or herself, to be masters over their own egos, over their own passions and over their own appetites to be among the people of God with lives defined by practical kindness, wholesomeness, and integrity. And if we are a people with these marks of character, we will make the work of our leaders a delight and not just a duty, a joy and not a burden. Amen.